Welcome fellow alumni. I'm Donna McPhee, Columbia College class of 1989. And I'm so excited to welcome you to the third of the Columbia Alumni Association's Columbia at Home webinar series. Um, we're so glad you've joined us tonight. Um, tonight's program is Improvising Virtual Lives at Home, Lessons from Jazz, which is hosted by Associate Professor of Music, Chris Washburn. Professor Washburn is the founding director of the Louis Armstrong Jazz Performance Program at Columbia and a GSAS alum. He has performed with the Duke Ellington Orchestra, Tito Piente, Eddie Palmieri, Justin Timberlake, Celia Cruz, Ruben Blades, Mark Anthony, Celine Dion, Anthony Braxton, and the Manhattan Chamber Orchestra, among many others. He has played on 150 recordings, seven of which have won Grammys. He leads his own highly acclaimed groups, Ciotos and the Rags and Roots Band. He is author of the book, Sounding Salsa, Performing Latin Music in New York, and editor of the book, Bad Music. His new book is Latin Jazz, The Other Jazz, just released yesterday by Oxford University Press. After Chris's talk, we'll have a Q&A. You'll be able to enter questions for Chris using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I'm pleased to welcome Chris Washburn to Columbia at Home. Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's an honor to be able to spend a few moments with you at home at this very difficult time. I also hope that you're all in good health and that you and yours are staying healthy and safe. I'd like to take a moment today just to talk about this music called jazz and maybe some lessons that we can learn in this time from the music that might help us through. You know, just the other day I was invited to a Zoom birthday party and uh, there was about 40 people on that call. It's a very dear friend, many of which were very famous jazz musicians. And we all wanted to sing happy birthday. I don't know if you guys have had this experience, but as soon as we started singing happy birthday, it became very apparent the limitations of Zoom and the limitations of being isolated in the sense that there is a latency, there's a delay in the, in the sound. And so it was impossible to actually sync. It was impossible to make music together. It was impossible really to groove. And indeed, we spend so much of our time now on Zoom and that latency is there. And you can feel it when you're having a conversation with someone and you overlap and you interrupt and you're not, there's these awkward moments of silences that are just a little bit too long or a little bit too short. Why? Because we cannot technologically navigate in the same way we do, we do face to face. And so at the moment, musicians and artists of all types, but musicians in particular, especially improvising ones are really suffering because the music has been silenced in many ways. We've, had to come about, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, where orchestras come together and they play a piece, but they're all sitting isolated. We even did that uh, with a uh, with the Bobby Sanabria big band just a few weeks ago. It was a fun project. We were all sitting there playing to a click track and and uh, hearing uh, each other's sounds, but not in real time. And it was the only way we could do it and overdub it, but it wasn't live interaction. The end result was cool. It was musical but the essence was missing. But you know, I've been teaching at Columbia now for 20 years and I teach a class called jazz. Some of you might've taken it over the years and it's changed a bit um, over time, but uh, it's really geared towards not anybody that's a professional musician or on that track. It's for any type of uh, um, major at all, but the idea is to introduce the class to the history of jazz. But more and more I've been thinking about, instead of just learning the history, what are the lessons in jazz? What are the lessons there that we can take away that can enhance our lives and enhance our, our different professions? And how can we 
grow personally and professionally from what this music gives us. And I've been working and perfecting this uh, message over the years and been teaching in the Columbia Business School a little bit as well and lecturing at the School of Public Health and across the university, especially to non-musicians to really talk about this. So I thought that I would just share some reflections that I've been dealing with, isolated myself, and turning towards jazz as a resource for um, persevering, persevering through adversity. And one of the things that's interesting about jazz, just like the, where it comes from, if we think about it, you know, it, it emerges in, in places like New Orleans in the end of the 1800s. And I wanna just show you a couple little images um, and I'm gonna share the screen with you and hopefully technologically this will not let us down. Sidney Bechet was a clarinetist um, that played with Louis Armstrong, who was from New Orleans, and was really one of the people that helped define the sound of jazz. And in his autobiography, when he was describing what jazz is, he had a very interesting definition. He said, jazz is the sound of freedom. It's the freedom that the emancipated slaves found in their lives, and they had to make sense of that newfound freedom. They had to reimagine the possibilities and build from the meager materials at hand something new and something special. They had to transform ugliness into beauty. And it's interesting to think about this definition of jazz because he's speaking about this music as a verb, not as a noun, not as an object, but as a way of being, as a way of thinking, as a philosophy of navigating life and taking inspiration from its origins the culture in which it emerges, that of African Americans in the late 1800s. But I mean, what does that actually really mean? The sound of freedom. What does freedom sound like? And what did it mean to those early innovators, the founding fathers and mothers of this music? Well, I found an image. This is the earliest depiction of jazz um, that we have. Um, it's from New the New Orleans Picayune, and it's from 1890. And it's a um, kind of an opinion piece. And you can see here that there's a veranda with a bunch of musicians, African-American musicians playing instruments that, you know, we didn't have the, the earliest recordings of jazz didn't come out until 1917. But you can see even those early rec jazz recordings, those instruments of the trumpet, the trombone, the clarinet and the drums were very much a part of this musical scene uh, 30 years before it first was recorded. But what you see is these musicians playing and everybody on the street who happens to be white and even the animals are saying, for God's sake, stop. And of course that person has got the name property holder just on his back. And everybody viewing this as noise, as something that is terrible. And this is the freedom that Sidney Boucher was talking about. This was being daring enough to assert your freedom in a milieu when you really weren't free. But in spite of that adversity, having a beautiful response to it. Now, maybe it wasn't taken as beautiful because it was loud, it was boisterous, but it was the music that eventually transformed the world because it was the very first popular music to emerge, right, with the advent of radio and also the record industry as we know it. And it went international quite quickly. When we, thinking about this image, of what jazz is and the kind of adversities that were faced by those people from which this music emerges as a cultural expression, we start to think about how it transformed over time and how musicians in our present day think about it. So if we look at two major innovators, Bill Evans, a pianist, uh, one of the most famous pianists that we've had in the 20th century, and Wayne Shorter, uh, one of the most famous jazz musicians that's still very much with us, uh, the saxophone player. What Wayne Shorter says is, he says, jazz means I dare you. And that dare to assert the freedom. When he was pushed further with this definition, he said, oh, it's simple. I imagine what the world could be, from my perspective, what it should be. 
and I make it so. Again, an action, a way of interacting with the world. And Bill Evans had a similar type of uh, definition where he said jazz is not a style, but a process of making music. It is the process of making one minute of music in one minute's time. And what he's referring to in this particular case is that what we are, what we do when we play jazz is the early innovators of this music took inspiration by the resilience of African American culture to rise up from its history, from a history where the culture was relatively silenced for 400 years and to rise up and give everyone a voice and play it loud and co-op those spaces that were not a part of that culture or that culture felt as though they were not a part of, to be bold, but to stand up to that adversity with a beautiful response. That alone for me has given me the inspiration to face the adversities that we are facing today. What jazz musicians do at the center, at the core of the music making is improvisation. But it's a special kind of improvisation. So what do we mean by improvisation, right? So many people say, well, make it up as you go or spontaneous creativity. And that's all partially true. But it's also years and years of preparation, of practice, of preparing to be able to imagine what the world should be and have it at the end of your fingers, the ability to make it so, to know all the possibilities. It's like one of those people that is a great orator and just has an incredible vocabulary and can draw from that and draw from anecdotes and really drive home stories and say them in a dramatic fashion. That's what jazz musicians do with their horns or with their keys or with their drumsticks or with their fingers. And why do we do it? Well, it's the resilience. That's the idea of being able to rise up resiliently and adapt, virtuosically adapt to any situation and transform it to our advantage. That's what we get and have inherited from African-American culture. This idea and this concept spoke to humanity so well that when the music emerges as a commercially viable music in the early 1920s, it swept the world and went international. It went global. And the way that musicians perceive the way this music functions in life is similar and in, in inflected in different and interesting ways. So what I would like to do right now is share with you a very short video. And it is a video um, that was produced by uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center. And it features um, the musicians that play at Jazz at Lincoln Center, Wynton Marcellus' band. And it's a narration um, from uh, Abdullah Ibrahim. And it's entitled, How Improvisation Saved My Life. Abdullah Ibrahim is the, I would say, arguably the most famous South African jazz musician. Uh, he just received uh, an NEA Jazz Masters Award, which is the highest honor any jazz musician can get in the world. Um, and this is a short story that takes about three minutes. It's accompanied uh, by um, some improvisation that talks about his experience and how he learned how improvisation was so important. Let's sit back and watch. I hope you enjoy. Amen. So I think here it really kind of accentuates that maybe the whole fundamental reason that human beings survive is that we improvise so well. We're so adaptable. We're adaptable creatures. Maybe that's why there's so many of us. You know, I was thinking that um, I was reading some, some books on history and reading about past ep epidemics. And, and it came, it was really interesting that one of the things that I noticed is that there was always incredible music made 
right in the aftermath of every single epidemic that we've had. And if you study the whole history of like Western classical music and you think about the various different types of adversities that people faced over time, music was oftentimes a place where they turn for solace, for getting through, for expressing the things that were so difficult to express at the time. It was a beautiful response to adversity. This predates jazz. But jazz just becomes a commercial music that at the heart of it becomes improv improvisation becomes centered, but it's improvisation of the individual, the individual voice that's prized. And if we think about Ibrahim's reactions to his situation, it was improvising in spontaneous and surprising ways. And indeed it's those musicians that are able to captivate us with surprises and twists and turns and seeing the world in ways that we had never imagined. I mean, that's the definition of an artist, I guess. And thinking to myself about teaching improvisation, especially at a university level, and especially to non-musicians, one of the things that's completely stifling is when you ask someone to improvise and you give them no guidance. You give them no structure. You, you give them no limitations. And indeed, when everything is a possibility, most people freeze up. But when you add structure or you add limitations, it's quite easy to improvise. Like when you only have two choices or three or four, or maybe only four rooms to kind of walk around in, right? And not be able to leave. And if we think about innovation, the history of world innovation, oftentimes it comes from the places with the least amount of resources. The least materials at hand can be the places that are the most spontaneous and the most improvised. So one of the assignments that I give to my class in jazz, and I've been giving for several years now, is that if you really want to know what it's like to be a jazz musician, Today after class, pick a new way to walk home, a way that you've never walked before. Columbia students tend to find this assignment quite nice because there's no reading and there's no writing. That's all they have to do. The next class they come in and I say, we have the same assignment this tonight. Again, they're quite happy. There's about 28 classes in a semester and every single night it's the same assignment after class. So at first they come in and they're saying, wow, that was an amazing assignment. Like I found a new restaurant right around the corner that I didn't know. And now it's my new favorite place to eat. There was an alum that came back to me at an alumni event and said, you know, on that second class, I met my future spouse. Amazing things happened. But of course, by the 28th class, it's getting so difficult to find new ways that some students are walking all the way to Staten Island before they cross campus. It's tricky and it's difficult. And then I say to them, now you're just beginning to understand what it's like to be a jazz musician, to live a jazz life, to see the world as a jazz musician does. In other words, never doing the same thing twice because no day is the same. It's always different. And so my challenge to myself and my challenge to you, especially in this time of where we have these structures that are keeping us confined in many different ways. It's the greatest opportunity to come up with something completely new because there's limited possibilities and there's adversity all around us. And what beauty will you create? I dare you. I dare you to be free and create it. I'll show you what jazz musicians do when I talk about this freedom, like, like how it works. Um, let's, uh, let's turn to, um, probably one of the greatest band leaders of all time, Miles Davis. Now, Miles Davis had a group in the 1960s that is oftentimes, uh, viewed as the, the pinnacle of improvisation. 
He had a multi-generational group. Wayne Shorter is playing saxophone in this group. Uh, there's a young 16-year-old Tony Williams, uh, Ron Carter, and then a young Herbie Hancock who was like 21 years old. And Herbie, of course, went on to be, has become very, very famous. But Miles had the uncanny ability to spark incredible individual contributions and incredible moments of beauty uh, with musicians. And he's been used as a model in so many ways. As a matter of fact, Apple uh, computers used his in the, ca the, uh, the campaign was called Think Differently. When that idea of just having a different perspective and what that can yield, just a small different change, just walking a different way across a room that you ever walked before. And what do you see? What do you find? could be nothing at all, or it could be something that is life-changing. But if I, we play this short clip that is um, from a live concert in Italy on October 11th in 1964, I just want to stop and start it and analyze it. They're just about to end the song. Miles was famous for never really talking about the music to his musicians and not really introdu introducing what he was going to play next. And so check out, check out what happens. It's both um, something that's uh, a failure and also a success and how jazz musicians listen deeply and interact with one another. Now, did you just hear what P Herbie Hancock on piano did? He just mimicked Miles Davis exactly right after he did it. He went and Miles did that and then Herbie went That's like a two-year-old mimicking everything you say all the time that drives you absolutely crazy. It's the lack of individuality, the lack of an individual idea. And look at the reaction that Miles do Davis does to this young Herbie Hancock on one of their first tours. Oof. That's like the worst thing you can possibly do to a pianist, play their instrument for them. And he does a line that is in the opposite direction that he just played. So that's a kind of a direct communication, schooling, the young uh, individual on how to have their own voice. But let's continue, then what happens? But there's no tempo. There's no way for the other musicians to know when to come in and what to play. So what do they do? They dare. And it was just that short melody that Miles played that gave them the tempo, which they all built upon, and they're improvising the harmony the rhythm, everything collectively. It's a spontaneous negotiation. It is what Bill Evans talked about. It is creating music right at the moment. Creating one minute of music in one minute's time. In other words, the second greatest lesson from jazz. Be nowhere else but here. Be in the moment, nowhere else. When they asked Wayne Shorter what he thought about when he played jazz, when he improvised, and he just said, well, I imagine what the world should be and could be and make it so, what he was really saying, I'm not thinking about anything. I don't have time. Because when we are truly in the moment, we don't have even a split second, a microsecond to have any thoughts at all except to be fully present. And for jazz musicians to create this spontaneity, this interaction, they have to be nowhere else but here. That's their professional mandate. As a matter of fact, they're in that state for the entire time they play a concert while they're on stage. I ask you, how often do you spend in that state in your professional lives? You know, those moments where you're so deeply engaged that you lose track of time or what psychologists sometimes refer to the state of flow, which actually, by the way, was d figured out by studying jazz musicians <laughs> as, this, as the research subjects. Is it a two hour concert's worth? when you're working. I mean, it can happen in our personal lives, right? We see an old friend that we haven't seen for a while and, you know, we go out to dinner with them in the good old days when you could go out to dinner and all of a sudden it's 2 a.m. and like what happened? Like the entire night just flew by. That state 
It represents the happiest moments of our lives. It also represents moments when we're at our creative height. It also represents moments when we reach our fullest potential as human beings. Jazz musicians figured out how to make a living being in that state. Let's listen just a little bit more and see what happens in this conversation that's spontaneous right on the spot. And listen to that beautiful moment. That's like when you're at a dinner party and there's a lull in the conversation and then someone says something stupid about the weather because everybody gets nervous. If you're at a dinner party with a bunch of musicians and there's a lull, everybody just rides it. Rides the lull and sits back, takes a deep breath, and then at the right moment, says something profound. And that's exactly what happens with Ron Carter right here at this moment. If we just back up a few seconds and listen to that glissandi that happens in the bass, that kind of boom, oh, so beautiful. And if you're a Sarah Vaughn fan and you've ever listened to her sing Money Funny Valentine, Miles Davis plays those really notes on the trumpet. That's a tribute to her. She always does that just about at this point in the song. It's a thickly rich musical style that is referencing its entire past at the same time sounding the present and thinking about the future possibilities. I wanna save some time for some questions and to have a little bit of a conversation with you all. But I would say this, I encourage you to seek out this YouTube clip of this Miles Davis concert. There's not a lot of concerts at this time that are shown in their entirety, just to see the dynamic of what it's like when you have five individuals truly listening to one another, truly communicating, and what the human capacity is for beauty when that happens, when we really truly align with others. It doesn't matter what profession you're in or what walk of life you're in or even in your personal situations, every single human interaction has the ability to groove. Not so much on Zoom, but in real life. So with those of you that are, have others close to you and nearby, are you really grooving with them? Are you really hearing them? Are you fully present when you're engaged? I know many of you are parents and now for the first time you're getting to spend an amazing amount of time with your youngsters. Sitting back, writing the laws in those conversations and being fully present for myself as a parent has been one of the most rewarding things of these times of quarantine. But I ask you also, imagine what walking home a different way or walking across a room to another part of, the, of your house or your apartment will yield. The journey's a long one. It's a lifetime. You know, musicians oftentimes laugh when people say, oh, it only takes 10,000 hours to be an expert. <laughs> Those are the kind of musicians you don't wanna listen to because you need musicians to have spent the time to learn. Everybody needs to spend the time to learn the technical capacities of what they, what they do and, the, um, and to be able to excel. But it really takes a lifetime of growth for a fulfilling life. And that's what living a jazz life is. Well, let's take some questions. That was wonderful, Chris. Thank you so much for sharing. And we have questions coming in. Don't forget to use the Q&A function on Zoom. We'll start with a question from Eric Dupire Nelson. It's been a long time since your salsa, soca, and reggae class. What have you been your go-to albums during quarantine? <laughs> Eric, it's so good to hear from you. I hope you're doing well and I hope you're safe. I always loved having you in class. And I know that, um, that you, your listening habits changed after being in that class, and that made me so happy and proud. I felt as, as though I was a success. Um, 
but it's interesting. You know, my listening habits have really been more introspective. And that's why I played the Money Funny Valentine with Miles. I wanted to just, I feel as though my life is slowing down and I want to hear slow music. And I want to hear it kind of drawn out in many different ways. And so I've been listening um, to, to a lot of the great jazz singers. But at the same time, when I'm cooking, I prefer to listen to Sean Kuti, uh, Fela's son, and kind of get the groove on. Wonderful. From Hannah Mitchell, how does a person cultivate improvisation personally when her creativity was squelched growing up? <laughs> Welcome to the world. That's a great question. You know, who are the greatest improvisers in the entire world? Like, who are they? They're two-year-olds, right? You put a two-year-old in a room, in an empty room, and with just a box, and that box gets transformed into a rocket ship, into a pet horse, into a race car, into a boat, all sorts of amazing things. They're absolutely amazing. And all of you were two at one point of your lives. And then something really tragic happened to you, preschool. And as soon as you went into school, that ability to just be completely present and playing and kind of uh, exploring the world in new ways, imagining the world and making it so, it's exactly what, what uh, Wayne Shore was talking about, does get squelched. It gets squelched in all of us. And the longer you stay in school, the worse it gets, really. We haven't ever figured out in education how to foster that innate ability that we all have um, at the same time as you know, being able to follow the rules and be socialized and working together. So what you're dealing with is something that is uh, everybody must contend with, including jazz musicians. But the thing is this, is you improvise every single day of your life. If you didn't, you'd be dead. You cross the street, you look one way, it's clear you look the other way and a bus is coming and what do you do? You step back, you improvise, therefore you survive that day. And there's these micro moments in your life where improvisation plays a role. Start to take notice. Start to take notice when you do use them. And what are the processes that are involved in those, those split second decisions? And then when you go, when you go to cook, take a risk, put an ingredient, ingredient you've never used in your dish and see what happens. Do something different every single day, walk a different way and look a different way and you will begun the path of reawakening what already lies inside of you, that ability to improvise beautifully. From Jeremy Liss, the 1918 mm. Spanish flu struck just as jazz was emerging as an art form. How did that pandemic impact the development of jazz? Well, thank you for saying that because absolutely that's one of the moments I was referring to is that in the aftermath of pandemics and wars, music transforms in really interesting and unique ways. What's, what's amazing though is that we don't, I'm not aware of any studies of someone that's actually looked at um, this in particular. Now, of course, in that time, um, for, the, for what I know about it, and I'm not an expert in, this, in, in, uh, in uh, pandemics and the history of that, but what, from, from what I know is that there was an economic crash and there was also a lot of businesses that went bankrupt and went, um, uh, and so there was a lot of venues that shut down. So there was a, there was a problem with uh, musicians making a living in the same way. There weren't as many quarantines as there is today. There wasn't that kind of that knowledge about how to not get sick. Um, so we didn't have to contend with so much of the social distancing. So I don't know how that, that, that transformed it. But when venues shut down, when there's limitations of places to play, what ends up happening is that musicians like all of us, continue to be creative on their own. And they'd start to develop um, ideas on their own. And there's a lot of examples in the history of jazz where a musician will kind of back away from public life and focus in on practicing and developing new ideas. Sonny Rollins is the most famous one that, um, um, who, who would practice outside uh, under the Manhattan Bridge, right? Uh, or Williamsburg Bridge, I always get it confused. But the idea is that um, then he came back 
with a new voice and a new vitality. And so I could imagine that has something to do with it. Also, the record industry had to rebuild itself and they were looking for new possibilities. They had been recording classical music and some folk music at time, that time and they started taking risks, more risks. And that's also when black music started to take off as a viable object. That study needs to be done further though. Great question. So I'm gonna combine a couple of questions um, from Elaine Meyer. How can you draw on principles of improvisation when you, you feel stuck creatively, creatively? And then Eduardo Moda said, to improvise, it is necessary to understand the rules, isn't it? What rules are we talking when we're talking about life? <laughs> oh, those are some great questions. So being stuck, um, we all get stuck, right? So that's, uh, and we get creatively stuck. And so what ends up happening to get unstuck at least for me, is to um, change the rules, <laughs> change the structures, change the limitations. Um, it's as easy as this. I need to write a piece of music and I just have no clear ideas what I'm gonna do. So what I say to myself is, okay, I'm only allowed to write music using two notes. And it's quite easy because you, cannot, you just have two choices and you just start to play those two notes and you try to figure out a combination that's of interest. And eventually a third note comes around. So in other words, limit the possibilities. That's the one thing. The rules of life, man, you make that up as you go. That's the whole idea. You know, what rules do you wanna have? And of course, um, as we live in the more experiences that we have, the more we understand what the possibilities are. But the idea is to go out and experience to break all of the rules, to ignore all of the rules, to create new rules yourself. Um, and I would encourage you to do that. Just don't do anything illegal and don't get arrested or anything like that. And as long as you're not hurt, harming anybody, yourself or anybody else, um, try to do it that way. Anoop Jassal asks, what resources would you recommend to better educate non-musicians to better appreciate live jazz? That's a great question. There is a book by Ted Joya on, I can't remember the exact name, I think how, how to listen to jazz or what to listen for in jazz, which is really good for musicians and non-musicians. Joya, it's with a G, G-I-O-I-A. Um, and, um, and I would say that that's not a bad place. There's also a book by John Swed called Jazz 101. Um, both of those are great resources. The other thing too is, you know, you have time at home right now. Just go to, if you have Spotify, go on to Spotify. And actually there's a Columbia alum who creates some of those jazz playlists there. Type in jazz and just let it play. Let it kind of seep into and brew slowly and steep slowly into your life. I think that is a wonderful way. And eventually you're gonna hear something that you kind of like, take note who that is, and then do a Spotify search just on that musician and listen to their playlist and expand it that way. And just hear there's such a wide variety of sounds. I think that these would be the two ways that I would suggest to doing it. Um, what vocalists would you suggest are great examples of improvis improvisationalists from Robert Cottingham? Um, <laughs> so there's, there's a number of jazz vocalists who are not necessarily known for their improvisational skills, but they're still great interpreters of song. But I kind of like, there's a, the three pillars for my taste are Billie Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, and Sarah Vaughan, because they improvise all differently. Ella Fitzgerald does a lot of scat singing. And so you hear that the scat singing kind of mimicking the, the horns and using these uh, vocables to create different textures. Um, so that's kind of a more traditional way that a jazz vocalist uh, improvises. Billie Holiday never scatted, but the way she interprets songs, she improvises with the rhythms and the phrasing and sometimes the words in such incredible ways. If you kind of try to feel the beat with her, she never lands on the beat. It's either ahead or behind. She sees they're a little flat or a little sharp in such beautiful and virtuosic ways. 
And then Sarah Vaughan, who is probably has the most incredible virtuosic voice of any singer in the 20th century, including any kind of style of music. She's just got a four octave range that is just to die for and listen to it, listening to her use it. You just forget the actual meaning of the words. It just becomes uh, an expression of sheer beauty. From Walter Rivera, can you speak about the emergence of Latin jazz in the spectrum? One of my <laughs> favorite artists was the late Hilton Ruiz. We both have roots in Hell's Kitchen. Yes, indeed you do. I played with Hilton for many years. Um, my new book that you can order now, um, and that just came out yesterday, is the whole, talking about the history of Latin jazz, and I trace its roots back to the year 1740, predating jazz. So the emergence, uh, I flip the, uh, it's kind of a revisionist history coming all the way to the present, where I flip the notion that jazz started and then Latin jazz emerged and um, uh, as a separate entity. It's actually the opposite. And if you've ever been to New Orleans, you'll definitely see that New Orleans, the food tastes different, the architecture is different, and the music sounds different than any other place. And why is that? Because it's the northernmost city of the Caribbean. And indeed, it was ruled by the French and the Spanish until the Louisiana Purchase in the early 1800s. But it, 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 had, it was the, one of the few places in the entire United States that did not have a conception of race as either black or white. It was black, white, and Creole. And so it was a different much more closer in line to culturally what happens in the Caribbean. And it remains that. And so that is the place that so much of this expression comes from. And if you listen to a lot of early jazz, you're going to hear rhythms like the clave rhythm and the habanera rhythm and the tracia rhythm. And you hear it today in modern New Orleans music. It's really Caribbean music. So I would say that uh, Latin jazz is one of the foundations Latin music and Caribbean music is the foundation of why jazz sounds the way it does. So Joey Sala says, in a world where platforms like Spotify use algorithms to suggest new music, how and where do you turn to get that surprising new artist or sound? <laughs> I turn to a couple of things. I do Spotify because it is algorithms to some extent, but it's also playlists that are compiled by musicians and by people that are employed there searching for new things. Um, uh, at the same time, I listen to WKCR because you never know what you're going to hear. Columbia's radio station is one of the greatest jazz resources uh, in the world. And so they're playing things that I'm many times they're playing things that I've never heard before or artists that I don't know, a rare recording that I hadn't heard. And so it's a way that I constantly try to keep expanding. Um, and at the same time, every time I teach a class um, on uh, music at Columbia, I try to have my students recommend what they're listening to, to hear what the younger ears are listening to and get cued into that. So Chris, to, one final question is going to come from me that I think it's important to share and I hear often from alumni who want to know about students and the student experience. And you've been teaching at Columbia for a while. So talk a bit about the students today and teaching them. How has that changed? What has been surprising? Um, and how have you changed your teaching over the years? Well, I've you know, Columbia is, I'm really, really blessed to be able to teach at Columbia. I, the students are amazing. I'm, you know, I think I learn way more than they, they learn. I learn from them. And it's given me a great opportunity to start a jazz program, a jazz performance program, which uh, specializes in students that are not music majors, but are studying, you know, intellectually engaged in the world, but are really dedicated and play at a high level. We have the biggest jazz program of Iva Ivies now, and we have some of the top high school jazz musicians in the country coming, turning down offers at our, our, um, at our peer institutions to come to Columbia because we're in New York City. So kind of taking advantage of that. You know, the, but there, there has been a huge generational shift within 20 years. And um, 
one of the reasons why I started to change how I taught my jazz class, a jazz class that I have been teaching for 20 years, to really focus in on the processes of jazz, some of the ideas that I introduced today, was that I felt as though there was a more, a greater distance between the knowledge of what jazz is and how it actually resonates in everybody's lives. And it's gotten farther and farther away. And I remember that, you know, you can put a picture up of Charlie Parker on saxophone and Dizzy Gillespie on trumpet, but don't label it and have them, you know, up on, uh, up on the screen in front of the class. And you're going to get students raising their hands saying, which one's Charlie Parker and which one's Dizzy Gillespie and, or not even knowing what an alto saxophone is. And so there is, uh, I find that, that, and it's not a, it's, you know, it's just the changing of generations, but, I feel as though it's vitally important to ground the students in this, these traditions and show them how it resonates in their lives and it dictates their own sonic landscapes and it, their, in their daily lives and how it can enhance it even more. And so uh, it's a real responsibility because now there's a history that could be, could be lost with these generational shifts. At the same time, we're kind of grounded in the core curriculum, which is, is uh, something that it's a canon, so it changes slower than other things over time, which is good and bad, uh, but it gives us a basis to kind of build upon. It's a fabulous tool to really talk about the present moment and how we are all implicated in the histories that uh, have shaped that canon and the forces that are there and how we play that out. And that's one thing that doesn't change. I find that students over time, once they, that light goes off and they recognize themselves in those texts that were written 2000 years ago, or those sounds that were composed a thousand years ago, that is a moment that I live for. And I constantly keep saying that gives me hope. <laughs> Well, Chris, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, certainly, you have educated and enlightened us. Um, you've given us reason to sit back and think about how we can improvise, certainly during this unprecedented time, but and beyond in what this new normal will be. Um, and I have had the privilege of hearing Chris perform um, multiple times uh, and even sat in a class. Um, so I encourage any of you who haven't heard Chris to um, go online, read the book and certainly follow um, Chris. Um, you certainly will benefit from it and certainly enjoy it. So Chris, thank you so much. Um, I hope all of you will join us for our next Columbia at Home program. Um, we will be highlighting former NASA astronaut and Columbia engineering professor Mike Massimino, who will read from Spaceman, the true story of a young boy's journey to becoming an astronaut, which is a new young reader's adaptation of his popular 2016 book, Spaceman. Mike Massimino will also share fascinating accounts from his time in space and explain how lessons learned in isolation have had an influence on him during the ongoing physical distancing as a result of this COVID-19 pandemic. It's next Wednesday, May 13th at a special time, 5 p.m. Eastern, to make it easy for families to join. You can register at alumni.columbia.edu. We thank you so much for joining us and please continue to share ideas of what you'd like to hear and see and continue to be connected to our strong and vibrant alumni community. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Stay well. <laughs>